Well, good morning, Champion Force. Let's stand together today. If you're worshiping from home, I just want to invite you to join in, to sing along. Scripture tells us that they who call upon the Lord will be saved. And so today, what do we need to call upon the Lord for? What things do we need to bring before Him? Do we need to lay down to give to Him? 1 Peter 5 says, to cast your anxiety upon him for he cares for you. So we know that our God cares. We know that he loves us. And so we're going to just call upon him today as we worship. We're going to sing this together. We need no other hiding place. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. What you began, you will sustain. What you began, you will sustain. This we know. together.
I find my rest And without you I fall apart You're the one Who guides my heart Let's sing this chorus out together Lord, I need you Lord, I need you Well, good morning, North Klein. It is so great to see you here this morning. We've got many more of you uh, tuning in online. It's great to have you with us as well. Guests, if you're here with us this morning, we are so honored that you have chosen to come worship with us at 930 this morning. And guests, if you're at home, thank you for being with us. We're, we just love when guests come and join us at North Klein. And we'd like to get to know you. If you wouldn't mind taking your phone out, and on the screen, we've got a number. If you just text that number and simply type in your first and last name and hit send, that will actually come to me. I will reach out to you this week. I'll either call you or text you just to say thank you for coming to worship with us. Do you have any questions about the church? Is there anything we can do to help you? And I would be honored to do that. Also, right after the service, we've got a guest tent outside uh, on the landing outside the atrium and Michelle and I will be there. We've got a, a small gift we'd like to give you just to say thank you for coming to worship with you. Shake your hand and, and get to know you. So thanks for being here, guests. Uh, Stephen and Chelsea Morris are out of town this weekend on a much needed vacation, but we've got a great treat today. Pastor Scott Riling, who's been on staff at Champion Forest for many, many years, is here and he's going to be uh, bringing our message this morning. So Scott, great to have you with us. Well, let's pray. Father, we're so excited to be here in your house uh, this morning. And Father, we humble ourselves and we join our hearts and spirits to say we love you, we praise you, we worship you. Lord, we're here to encounter you. We're here to experience you. Thank you that you're here. 
and that you have blessings for us this morning. And so, Father, we open our hearts and our minds and our ears and pray that whatever it is you want us to receive from you this morning, that we will receive and that we'll grow closer to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So Jesus, today, we fix our eyes on you. As we have placed our trust in you, we pin our hopes on you. Our faith is in you. So take us today, where we stand, where we are, all that we bring, and make us whole. Draw us into your presence. Make us more like Jesus as we seek you today, Father. So we give you this time. We pray that you would use it for your glory and for your honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Be seated. Good to see you all this morning. Yeah, and it's a privilege to be here. I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I filled in for Stephen when he was out of town that introduced the book of James, and now I'm kind of closing it out. So uh, I don't know if that was uh, designed that way or not, but uh, it's good to be back with you. The difference is, is and now I'm live with you where we were still kind of doing some things by video and then at the Champions Campus, I think for just the, a couple weeks they had done it where it was live streamed, but there was no audience there. There was none of the congregation that was there. And so <clears throat> when I did that the last time, uh, we videoed it on Thursday. Uh, and then um, that Saturday morning, uh, Pastor Stephen Trammell called me and he was coming back from Louisiana and he was a little bit delayed and he said, hey, Scott, do you think you could preach for me Sunday morning? And I said, uh, yeah, sure. And he said, well, just go ahead and do the same message that you did over at North Klein, and that would be great because we're on the same passage. I said, oh, okay, that's great. So anyways, then, so then that Sunday morning it was live. Well, as soon as I started uh, 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 preaching, then my, I could feel my phone buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And I'm like, okay, what's going on here, you know? And so anyways, when I got back down, I had all these text messages, people saying, where are you? Because I was about five minutes ahead of myself here on video, and they said, and how come you got two different shirts on, you know? What's going on? Where are you? You going back and forth? And so modern technology, you know, it can accomplish a lot of things, uh, but sometimes it can uh, cause some confusion as well, can it? Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to uh, James, and we're going to be looking at chapter 5. James chapter 5. And as we're looking this morning here at this, you're going to see some reoccurring themes. Uh, James, one of the most practical books in the Bible, just basically how to live the Christian life, how to live your faith, how to live it out. It's, it's just right where we live, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And so when he closes it out here, he just touches, basically, and expands a little bit more on some things that we've already seen. So in James, as he's gone through it, he's talked about um, addressing temptation, issues like temptation, steadfastness, putting, uh, to, uh, putting what you believe into practice. You know, faith without works is dead, as he said. Not showing partiality, controlling the tongue. In other words, being careful what you say and that it brings glory to the Lord. Where to find wisdom, avoiding worldliness, and submitting to God's will. And it almost seems like then today, as he closes it out, he just reminds us of some things that still are reoccurring things in our lives that always needs attention. So I'm going to break this up, and if we could just imagine... If we could kind of look at this if, as much as possible, like they would have in at the time when they would first be reading James, is that they were just a congregation of people, of believers, and they're reading this letter. 
that came from the, 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 the one who was brother of Jesus, but he was also the leader of the, Jerus- or the church in Jerusalem. And they would have shared it. And so as we come, kind of come in this morning to kind of look at it that way and to be able to say, well, let's just break this apart and let's just kind of look at what James is reminding us of some things before he closes out these, this letter. So the five things I want to kind of bring out in this, or I want us to look at in this passage, number one, don't get trapped by greed, verses 1 through 6. Learn to endure, verses 7 through 11. Be honest. Be a person of your word. Have integrity, verse 12. Make prayer a priority, Don't take it for granted. Don't neglect it. Verses 13 through 18. And finally, care about those who are lost and confused. Verses 19 through 20. So let's look at the first part. And what I'm going to go ahead and just read those verses and then we'll go back and make some comments. I'll make some comments along the way, but then we'll kind of break it down a little bit more. Beginning in chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now, I don't know about you, but probably if you said that, they'd be saying, I think I've heard enough right there. I don't want to hear any more about what James has to say. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. In other words, this is what you've been consumed with rather than the coming of the Lord or this, when, when he will return. But, but you have been so consumed about this wealth and the acquisition of wealth and materialism that you're not even anticipating the Lord's return. So you've laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, verse 4, Behold, the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, my goodness, What a way to start closing out the letter. What an indictment. How many have heard the the saying before, money is the root of all evil? Anyone ever heard that said before? Yeah. Sometimes we've heard people that it's probably one of the first indications that they don't read the Bible a whole lot, but they'll come out with that. They'll be kind of quoting what they think that the Bible says. But money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the Bible says. In 2 Timothy Chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's a big difference. Once again, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wondered, that some have wondered, away from the faith, and pierce themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So right at the outset, James is not talking about anybody who might have wealth or anybody who has acquired wealth is automatically evil and judgment awaits you. He's talking about those that wealth has become their gods, that they crave after wealth. They crave after materialism. That becomes their god, and it rules their life. And not only have they acquired this and sought this for themselves, but they've also used it against in their uh, uh, their authority or their power over others. Big difference here. There's often two extremes when the subject of money and religion come up. Some Christians feel called to rant and rave against the evils of riches, somehow thinking that a little guilt is good for the soul. 
Others preach the prosperity gospel, which is at its core only a perversion of the true gospel and is actually born out of self-indulgence. So there's this in-between area, this middle ground. As the saying goes, do you have money or does money have you? Which one is it? You know, it's hard. We're all materialistic in some ways. All of us. You can't live in the United States, the most prosperous country in the world, and not struggle with materialism sometimes. And I don't know about you, but uh, you know, we are constantly bombarded with advertisements that are telling us what we need and what we really want. Maybe we don't even realize it, but this is what you really want. And some of us, we buy the line. But what James is saying here is, is that, look, if that is what you value the most in life, and that is what you find yourself thinking about, consumed with, wanting the most in life, that's where the danger is. And what he said right here of these that were consumed by riches, he said that, that the corrosion of the things that are most valuable to you are going to be a witness against you. So if that becomes your God, guess what? It's all going to fade away. It's all going to just rest and fall fall away. And it's going to testify against you because that was your God. And then when you one day do stand before the Lord, you have nothing. Meanwhile, many, many times, we even see examples in the scriptures where people of means, used it for God's glory. It was the idea that I am simply a conduit. And if God has blessed you with the ability and the intelligence and the skills to make money, but your attitude is, listen, he will take care of my needs, but I'm a conduit through which I bless others. And it's all about the kingdom ultimately because I can't take any of this with me. Now you have the right attitude as opposed to these that James talks about at first. So he's not just getting on people that have money. It's whether or not the money and those people has cons- have consumed the people. So that's the first thing he wanted to kind of remind us of as he closed out, closes out the book. So what's the second thing? Learn, learn to endure. Learn to to endure. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Now, I wouldn't know anything about marathons. I don't do marathons. I walk. I walk rapidly, but I walk. I don't run. I admire those who can. I like watching those who like to run. And what I see, even with those who train whether you've gone down the Houston Marathon or whatever, even those that train, there are at different times in that race where you can see the pain and the perseverance that's showing on their faces as they push through some of those walls that they hit. So it is with the Christian life. And James is just trying to re- remind everyone, listen, learn To endure. Richard Carlson, in his book, uh, it's it's been around for a long time, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. He said, The quality of patience goes a long way toward your goal of creating a more peaceful and loving self. The more patient you are, the more accepting you will be of what is, rather than insisting that life be exactly as you would like it to be. Without patience, life is extremely frustrating. You are easily annoyed, bothered, and irritated. Patience adds a dimension of ease and acceptance to your life. It's essential for inner peace. It's essential for inner peace. 
And that's why, again, with all the things that James has discussed, he once again reminds us about how we have to be careful in the craving for things don't actually put us in bondage. And then the second thing that he wants to address and bring up is to learn to endure and learn patience. Now, of all the things he could have talked about, why did he bring that up? Because he knows that we as human beings struggle sometimes with patience. Some of the most difficult times, you know, it's been a little bit different with the whole COVID-19 and all, but some of the most difficult days that I would have was when I would have to go downtown, not so much the north hospitals, but the south hospitals, to visit folks and see people in the, hosp in, in, in the hospital. Why was it so hard? Because I had to drive on I-45 to get there. And just that experience alone would raise my blood pressure and make me aggressive. I, I can be aggressive on my own without any help. I don't know what it is about driving down the road that sometimes I might fixate on a car that's getting ahead of me and why all of a sudden I feel like i got to get back ahead of him. Heaven forbid anybody pulls out in front of me coming on the entrance ramp. That's why I don't have a fish on the back of my car. But <laughs> to learn patience. And it's hard in our world because everything is so fast paced. We have access, which I'm not so sure it's a good thing, but instantaneously on these things. Some of y'all might be checking to see what the weather's going to be like this afternoon, right now. Instant information, and consequently, a lot of the information that we've gotten in our world today on an everyday basis can just simply make us more anxious and impatient. But he says, learn patience. The compound Greek word is made up of words for long and temper. Long temper. In other words, learn to have a long fuse as opposed to a short fuse. See, you can be an impatient person and never have outbursts of anger. But on the inside, you could just be boiling or antsy or anxious. He says, have long temper. James is sitting here saying, look, be, be patient as you look to the coming of the Lord. Whether it is you leaving this earth through death or if he comes again. But learn to endure. Just like the farmer he uses the analogy of the farmer in uh, the, the, the first church that had the chance to pastor uh, straight out of seminary was up in West Texas. Little town called Spring Lake where there was no spring and there was no lake. One red light was some of the best five and a half years of our lives up there. If somebody had taken me, if God had told me, that's going to be where you're going to pastor first, I would have said, I'm a city guy. Why are you bringing me out? I don't know anything about farming. I don't. It was incredible. I learned so many lessons out there about life. And one of them was to see those farmers every time when they would go out, they'd prepare the fields. And then they would plant the seeds. And then they'd watch the skies. Yeah, they had water too, but that was expensive. And so they had to be careful how much they ran the sprinklers. And they'd watch the skies for so hopefully moisture and rain to be coming in, but yet not too much. And then when it came, went later on, you didn't want you know, uh, too heavy a rain. It had to be just the right amount. But to be patient from the time that they prepared the field and planted the seed to sit back and then watch the crop growing waiting for the harvest, realizing all the more that so much of what they need was totally in God's hands. They could do their part, prepare the field, plant the seed, but the rest was up to God to grow it. So it is with our lives. James is not saying to have a sense of fatalism. We shouldn't have the attitude like, well, you know, whatever's going to be is going to be, you know, so I mean, just kind of just kind of go along and just rock and roll through life that way. No. He said, but learn patience. And learning patience comes in time. 
He talks about the prophets. And in, in Hebrews eleven thirty-seven 37 through 40, he talks about the prophets and those who longed for the coming of the Messiah, but yet never saw him. But they kept waiting and they kept longing and looking to the coming of the Messiah. He talks about Job, the twofold realization of, 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 uh, of, um, of God, compassion in the innermost parts when he was talking about Job. He says, verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establishing your hearts, settling your hearts, if you will, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Why would he bring up grumbling when he's been talking about patience? Why? Because impatience, guess what? Causes tension between one another. So that you may be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Don't judge one another. You're all, we're all going to be judged by the supreme judge. As an example of the suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. We admire those prophets that were steadfast, even though they never actually saw the Messiah. We admire them for what they prophesied and waiting on the Lord. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. One of my mom's favorite sayings was, you know, boy, he has the patience of Job. I remember her saying that. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So he talks about learning patience. And every one of those examples were what? They're examples of people who suffered. And patience is learned through suffering. Now, some might get the lesson very quickly and your suffering is not all that serious others have suffered much but through it all when you constantly come back to as we just sang you know through it all through it all my eyes are on you and regardless of what you go through in life to not be overcome by that you say through it all through it all my eyes are on you then god then he, he perfects, if you will, as James said in the first, uh, first chapter, he perfects patience and steadfastness in you and in us. And James wanted to remind everybody, look, that's an important feature. That is an important feature. Thirdly, be honest. What he said in verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by the other oath or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Remember Jesus saying that, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person of integrity. Don't be captivated by riches. Don't let them put you into bondage. As you live out this life, look for the coming of the Lord and learn patience. It doesn't just come automatically, but learn patience. And through it all, make sure that one of the desires of your heart, in fact, the first desire of your heart, is that you be a person of integrity. Where you don't have to add anything else to what you say. I don't know about you, but have you ever said, um, well, to be honest with you, and then you make a statement? Is that to imply that everything else you say is not honest? Well, to be honest, what am I saying? Frankly, oh, so everything you else say is not frankly. It could be a little bit wishy-washy. But when we say frankly or to be honest with you, we're announcing, okay, now you can believe me on this. You see, back in that day, the Jews, they would swear by the temple or swear by the gold of the temple. To try to add authority or add uh, emphasis to what they were promising. But the problem is, is the temple was going to fade away one day. The gold on the temple was going to fade away one day. But they didn't want to say, I swear by the Lord. Why? Because if they sweared by anything else, they had some wiggle room in case they didn't want to do it. 
What James is saying here is, look, if somebody asks you something and you, whatever your word is, they can take it to the bank because they know that you're an honest person. And you mean what you say. And you will do what you say. And they can trust you. Fourthly, make prayer a priority. Now, I saw different estimates and all, but I think there was like, what, 50,000 that were in Washington, D.C. Uh, yesterday for a time of prayer and repentance and revival, praying for our nation. Making priority, making prayer a priority. Here, James encourages those who are sick, weakened by their suffering, to call for the elders of the church to support and, for support and encouragement in prayer. So he goes on, he says, verse 13, If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, the faith, a prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three, month, or three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So we should pray. Look what he says. Just some things about what he says right here when he talks about the person who's suffering and, and to pray for this person. Let the person take the initiative. If any among you are sick, then ask for prayer. You take the initiative. Remember in John chapter 5 when Jesus was walking along and he was going by the pool where you know, the, the legend was that the angel would come and stir the waters and if you're one of the first to get into the waters, then you would be healed of your affliction. And Jesus is walking past, and, and you know he walked past many people who had all kinds of infirmities and were sick in all kinds of ways. He walks right up to one fellow who's been there for 30-some years, back and forth, back and forth. And he walks up to him, and he says, do you want to get well? What an absurd question, right? Why would Jesus ask this man who's crippled, by the pool, and the man said, I've been waiting here 30 years, and yet people will always get ahead of me and get him. You mean within 30 years you could not have found someone to dump you into the pool in time when the, when the angel stirred the waters? No, Jesus asked him, said, do you want to get well? It's an odd question. You know, sometimes there can be a lot of attention in remaining in your sickness. You can, there can be some advantages to that. You can get out of a lot of things because of sickness. You know, how badly do you want to get well? And here in James, he's saying, look, if any of you are sick, call for the elders. Take the initiative to call for the elders to come. Secondly, involve the leadership in the church. So he's calling for the elders, verse 14. Anointing is not the focus prayer is when we think of anointing verse 15 it says that that he will be anointed uh, anointing sometimes in the scriptures was used for sacramental reasons you know when david uh, was anointed by samuel sometimes the anointing is medicinal we can think of the good samaritan when uh, the good samaritan came by and saw the man who had been beaten and he was bloodied and he took him and he said he put wine to to kill the germs and then he took oil to soothe his broken skin and to soothe his body. So sometimes uh, anointing was for medicinal purposes. And finally, uh, anointing could be refreshing. Sometimes it was for refreshing. When David, King David, had been praying and fasting for the child to, to survive, and when the child died, then he got up, cleaned up, anointed himself because it was a refreshing time. Because, you know, the, the child was in his hands. And, and his, the servants couldn't understand it. It's like, wait a minute, you were, you were, you know, 
just completely wrung out for the child when he was alive. And now that the child has died, it doesn't look like you're grieving. He says, you know, the child is with the Lord. One day I cannot bring the child back to me, but one day I will go to be with the child. But then when the anointing was before, okay, I need to refresh because I'm still trusting in the Lord. The emphasis is not on anointing. It's on prayer. So in a sense, that if, this, if this was used in the sacramental way, then, okay, it's setting aside the person here for the attention of the Lord, and it was, it was part of the worship of the Lord, yet the emphasis is on praying, calling out to the Lord on behalf of the person. If it was for medicinal purposes, then they would do all they knew in that day and time to do everything, if you will, medically for the person, but yet what? The emphasis was still on prayer. Now, I think it's important just in a, by the way, what time am I done here? Am I already past time? I've got until noon, right? No? No? Okay. All right. What, what time? What, guys, help me out. What time? I'm, I'm feeling like I can keep, just keep going here. Okay. Now? Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll get done here. All right. There's a lot. Hey, it's chapter five. Come on now. You know, give me a break here. But if it was, you know, a lot of people sometimes have struggled, you know, if I get treatment or if I, whatever it might be, is that showing a lack of faith in God? Numerous times I've talked with people who, whether it's cancer or some uh, ailment and they, they've got maybe a, a, a high risk, if you will, surgery or whatever it might be, chemotherapy, whatever, say, well, is it a lack of faith if I get treated is that showing that I really don't trust God to heal me? Listen, God can heal you miraculously without any help from anyone else. However, I believe that God has also allowed us to discover, and we have men and women uh, who have discovered incredible things that God has known all along in how to treat us. Dr. Spafford, all those years of studying, he's learned how to treat our bodies but he would be the first to tell you that ultimately he can't heal anybody. It is God that brings the healing, but he's also given us some things that will help in the process, if we will, as we come alongside him. People with mental illness sometimes have struggled. Well, listen, is that a lack of faith? If, if, I, if, I, if I take medication, if I struggle with bipolar or manic depression or whatever it might be, is that a lack of faith in God that he can heal me? And I say that God can heal you. He can heal you. But sometimes he uses things to be able to help when there is a chemical imbalance. And all that's going to do is not going to fix all of your problems. It's just going to lift you up so that you can learn to rethink. As Scripture says in Romans 12, that do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, what? By the renewing of your mind. But I tell somebody, say, look, if I were to walk outside and I didn't have shoes on and I step on a rusty nail... I am going to be praying all the way to the emergency room to go get some antibiotics. It's not an either or. You're still trusting the Lord. And here he says, call, those that are sick, call for the elders, come, they anoint, and then there will be healing. If, an, if the anointing was the focus of it, then we have a problem because in verse 15 he says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and will, the Lord will raise him up. And then he says, therefore, and also confession, obviously, is factors into the healing process right there, verse 16. But he says, pray for one another, making prayer a priority. Praying for one another, praying for our country, as I just mentioned, like Elijah did. Why? The reason why he asked God to stop the rain was so that the nation would understand their complete need of him. And then when he prayed again and the rain came, it was clear the Lord, I mean, the people then could understand and appreciate their dependence on him and how much they needed him. Number five, fifthly, verses 19 20, keep seeking truth. Keep seeking truth. Care about those who are lost and confused. What about those who 
maybe were believing or they were walking right and then they've gone astray. We see people every day that, that become confused and burdened down or leave the truth or, and, and the deceiver comes and carries them away. Keep seeking truth. Remember Jesus' words in John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Help those who have gone astray return to the truth. Finally, take to heart the eternal ramifications. James is telling us here as he closes out, in a sense, you are your brother's keeper. Yes. As you learn these things and you practice these things in your life as a believer, but also look out for the one who is struggling or who might stumble. And yes, you do have a responsibility to reach out to them. You have the responsibility of knowing truth in its own right and for you to follow truth and and to keep walking in truth. But when you see someone else leaving the truth or falling aside or or going astray, reach out to that person. Consider the eternal ramifications. Verse 19, my brothers, if any among you wonders for the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a a multitude of sins. Care about those who fall into uh, false teachings or false beliefs or untruth. We have a responsibility. You know, the old ad is saying, well, the two things you don't ever talk about is politics and religion. I say that is not true, and it's not in the Bible. And first of all, yes, we should care enough for people, especially if they don't believe the truth, to tell them truth of the gospel. And when people are believing the wrong things about God, thank God, first of all, that you're still walking in truth. But say, God, help me to reach out to them to bring them back from their wondering. So there we go. James has reminded us of some important things before he closed out his letter. The most practical book in the Bible, talking about where we really live, and he closes out by just reminding us, watch out for wealth, getting a hold of your heart and that becoming your God. Be careful and pray for one another. Learn endurance, patience. You're going to need it in life. You cannot live the life without patience. Ask God to teach you patience through life, through the struggles. Be a person of integrity. Walk in truth. It's so important that God's people be known as people of truth. And finally, when you see someone that has left truth and is wandering and confused and broken, yes, it is your responsibility as the body of Christ to reach out to them, to bring them back in. So finally, we don't assume, even in a room full of people and those that you might be watching online, that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In one sense, it's the most simple thing to, to, to grasp, and yet the most difficult. It's not easy believism. But as what Scripture says is that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Nobody is ever going to be able to get to heaven by being good enough. We're all going to fail. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The key question here as we close out and close out this book, and what James, the, 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 the um, assumption in the book of James, and especially in this last chapter, the assumption is that these things are only realized through a relationship with Jesus. You can't do them. It's impossible to do it on your own. It's impossible. Do you have that personal relationship with Jesus? I pray that today, if there's any question in your mind, that that would be settled. That would be settled in your heart. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your word. It is rich. It is deep. It is profound. And yet, it is so plain. 
in so many ways. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would enable us to receive this truth, that you would open our minds and our hearts to this truth, that it would take root in our hearts, that we might live out what we've just read about, even in the week ahead of us. And Lord, I pray for the person here that may not be sure that they're in you. The scripture says, in fact, it was John that tells us that these things have been written that you might know that you have eternal life. We don't have to doubt it. You've told us how it comes. That you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, make that a reality in our lives today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, please welcome Cheryl Spafford. I didn't have any balloons. I want you to stand with us together and sing this together today. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of
right, thank you, James and Praise Band. Whew, what a morning. Thank you, Scott. Scott was the middle school pastor when I was just a wee tot. <laughs> we were talking earlier this week, and he was asking how we do the handoff. And he's like, oh, I usually just, I was like, oh, I need a little bit more pomp and circumstance. So that's why he was giving me a hard time. <laughs> But we needed to give James and the praise team that benediction. That was just such a cool way to end James, right? Oh, so good. Thank you all. That was just powerful. Um, for those of you that are here this morning, thank you for being here this morning. I feel like each Sunday we come back, it's just, it's a coming back. And it's just a, a coming together, the family of God. And so this is your first time back. Or maybe your first time here Thank you for coming. And as you exit these doors, if you choose not to join or come to Life Group this morning, although I encourage you, it's just a quick up the stairs. We have adult Life Groups for those that are adults, and we have kids ministry. We have student ministry just right outside these glass doors out here in the metal building. I like to call it the student barn. Um, it's just a wonderful place for students. It's just incredible ministry that's happening out there, intentional ministry for our students. I'd encourage you. Just take an extra hour of your morning. I promise you, you won't regret it. And if you're not sure where to go, right out here in our Welcome Center, we have a description of every single one of our life groups, of the room number, where to go, who's leading it, so you can get an understanding as to what's going on in each area. There's a map exactly how to get there, although it's really hard to get lost here because <laughs> it's just one floor and another floor. Um, so we'd love for you to try that out. But if you just wanted to come to worship today and then you want to come back next week after you have a better grasp of what we have to offer, just know right outside these glass doors we have a guest canopy. And we would love to greet you there. Louis and Michelle Miori are there. We have a package for you. It has the book of Proverbs there. Because one of the things here at, at North Klein is we love for people to be established in God's word. And so we could just help you along that way. We have a Proverbs journal in there where you can read the word of God journal your thoughts in your heart, and then we'd love for you to come back and talk to us about what the Lord's taught you and how he's um, grown you in your wisdom and your understanding of his word. But also, as you exit, we have our giving boxes. That's how we do the offering here. And so if you want to grab an envelope that's in the back seats behind you, you're welcome to do that and drop it off in the box. But also for our voting members here, I don't want to end the service um, by praying without first telling our members that this week, by Tuesday, I believe at 5 o'clock, we're asking each of you to go online and to vote. We're voting for our new deacons, as well as we have a few guys that are going to be ordained, as well as for our new budget year. And so if you would like to go online, we'd love for you to do that and to cast your vote. There's some exciting things happening at Champion Forest at all four of our campuses. Even here at North Klein, it's just been incredible over the past several months, just people that have called because of either the online service or the on-campus services that are getting saved, becoming members virtually as well as here. And just it's just been incredible the way God is continuing to grow our body of Christ. So would you all pray with me real quick? Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you for this morning. Thank you for the word that you gave James. Thank you that as a half-brother of you, what he didn't rightly know at first, God, he came to know in a real and awesome way to challenge us as believers, both yesterday and today, how to walk rightly with you, awaiting your return to patiently endure. God, may we be found faithful. May through it all, we fix our eyes upon you. May our worship be in both spirit and in truth. God, thank you for allowing us to be family here because of you and because of salvation that we have in you. Well, you love you, Lord, and we praise you. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. God bless you.